animal trophies, narcotics, human trafficking. I think I may have just stepped on a crab. Those are things that we really are fighting as East Africans. How much cocaine is this? One kg. Does this go on to other places? Gina, Dubai. The U.S. has been making a concerted effort into getting Kenya to treat its borders the way that the U.S. treats its borders. 500 kgs that were confident in this airport. 500 kilograms? More than 50 kilograms have died. Do we even have an idea of why this border was placed here? Nobody knows. We're following a group of anti-poaching rangers. Oh, we actually just crossed the border, apparently. Jesus. Yeah. That smell. Right now, we're very close to the border between Kenya and Tanzania, just on the Kenya side. We're also on the coast, so we're very close to the Indian Ocean. This bridge here leads to a tiny little village called Jasini, which is right on the border. The border literally cuts through the middle of the village. So that rickety wooden bridge is effectively an international border crossing. It's a private individual who put up this bridge and now charges a small toll for people to go back and forth. And it's completely unregulated. There's no government presence here whatsoever. The village of Jassini doesn't even show up on, on a map. And yet, this is the principal way that people get across this border. You have motorcycle traffic back and forth every single day. A few minutes ago, we even saw a, a funeral procession, totally unregulated, totally unsurveilled, totally unofficial. And this, by the way, is much busier than any official border crossing in this area. We asked a local community leader named Mohamed Farunzi to show us around the village. So that's the border marker. So the border is running like this. You see? Here. So you're in, you're in Tanzania right now? Me, I'm already in Tanzania. Yeah, that happened very fast. Yeah. Do people take advantage of how open this is? Yeah, smuggling is done here. Smuggling of what kind of things? Smuggling, smuggling of uh, wildlife, uh, such as turtles, uh, tusks, elephant tusks. Yeah. It's, a, it's a issue that we have come across. Do the authorities ever try to control this? The police post is almost five kilometers away. Mm -hmm. And if it is in Tanzania, the security forces are almost seven kilometers away from the border. Some smuggling is so commonplace that nobody bothers to hide it. Here in Kenya, this is not prohibited. Uh, the Mira in Tanzania is prohibited. Right. So are they from Tanzania? Yeah, some are from Tanzania, some are Kenyans. So this is cut or mida, as they call it here in Kenya. It's, it's a drug, basically, it's a stimulant. So people from Tanzania cross over into Kenya, purchase this legally, and then cross it back to Tanzania. It's not like a large-scale narco-trafficking operation, but it's nevertheless, strictly speaking, it's illegal cross-border drug traffic. The place where the land border between Kenya and Tanzania meets the sea border on the Indian Ocean is a new hub in the world of international smuggling. Multiple illicit currents meet here on their way to markets in every direction. Wildlife products poached in the African interior go to Asia. Narcotics from Asia go to markets in East Africa or as far away as Europe. Even migrants from different parts of Africa pass through here on their way halfway across the world. Migrant smugglers use this remote river delta, a few miles from the border, to move their human cargo undetected. We managed to track down a local fisherman who is taking us to the coast. 
in the course of his work, he's seen some of the sort of illicit paths through the forest and illicit landing sites off the coast that smuggling networks use. We obviously need to hide his identity because these are pretty powerful and extensive transnational smuggling networks. Wow, this water is hot. I think I may have just stepped on a crab, which actually I feel guilty about. Uh, Jesus. This is taking way longer than I expected. Honestly, it just gives you a sense of how vast and remote this whole area is and how easy it is to move around here without being detected. Even though it feels like we're in the middle of nowhere, you can see there's tons of footprints all over the place. The people that are coming from Ethiopia come this uh, uh, small boat. When I took Ethiopia, when I let to Hapa, I could go to Haiti, because I was going to go to Hapa. When I was going to go to Hapa, I was machine to go to Hapa. When I was going to go to Hapa, as it turns out, this placid hidden harbor is a stop in an intricate global human smuggling network. So what we've just been told is that migrants from Ethiopia primarily are picked up here to then be transported to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. From there they go to South Africa, and from South Africa they go to either Europe or the United States. How do you know all of this information? Have you seen it happen? <laughs> Do a lot of local fishermen get sort of roped into that kind of work? Yeah, yeah, yeah so many. The authorities here, the try to get local people from the community to give them intelligence, to give them information. Have they ever asked you to inform for them in that way? In the last decade, the U.S. has spent more than $500 million in security assistance to Kenya, including several programs for border enforcement specifically. The targets are criminal and terrorist networks, which are often one and the same. The U.S. has officials stationed in Kenya from an alphabet soup of agencies, including the FBI, the DEA, and Customs and Border Protection. They work closely with Kenyan officials like John Elungada, the highest security official on the Kenyan coast. What kind of relationship does the Kenyan government have with the United States when it comes to security and specifically border security? Very good. We collaborate with them on a number of cross-border activities. And last year, we had a team who visited the U.S. to see how the U.S.-Mexico border operates and how the U.S. is able to contain those who would want to bring in contraband into the U.S. Do you, as a Kenyan official, ever worry or feel concern that the United States is essentially exporting a model of border security to this part of the world that has not been successful even in its own no, backyard? No, they are not exporting any model to us. What we're copying from the U.S. is a multi-agency approach. Because, mm. you know, crime is crime. Narcotics is what we are fighting mostly. Narcotics, animal trophies, uh, human trafficking, terrorism, those are things that we really are fighting as East Africans. There's one illicit trade in particular that's become a major focus for the US. Wildlife trafficking. Products like ivory from elephants and the scales of the pangolin, a small nocturnal mammal are poached and smuggled out by the tons, headed mainly to China and other Asian markets. It's a trade valued in the tens of billions of dollars.
At Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, the authorities use dogs trained to sniff out ivory and pangolin skins. This is worked ivory. This is worked ivory. Worked yeah. ivory. And were these worked pieces part of an actual seizure that happened here? Yes. You would think that something like this is a purely state function. But in this case, it's actually sort of a hybrid between the state and a nonprofit called the African Wildlife Foundation, which is one of the major international nonprofits for wildlife conservation, funded by American government, European government sources. They've supplied the training for the dogs, they've supplied the vehicles to move the dogs around. So they've basically propped this up and then allowed the Kenya Wildlife Service to actually carry it out. So what's happening now is we have a mix of actual luggage that's just been taken off of a, a plane that legitimately landed here in Nairobi, but then we also have some tests or demonstrations that are being done for our benefit just to show how these dogs have been trained to identify a couple of specific illegal wildlife products. Good guy, good guy. Check out. Show me baby gun. Good guy. Yes. Good, yeah. Woo! This is a case from a mammal that's called Pagorin. It's the most trafficked mammal in the world currently. Pangolin scales are mainly used as medicine in China and Vietnam. In some places, they've been hunted nearly to extinction. Actually, they had a consignment of 500 kgs that were completely in this airport. 500 kilograms? 500 kilograms, yeah. So how many dead pangolins is 500 kilos of scales? More than 50 pangolins have died. Were you able to figure out where they were coming from and where they were going? They are basically coming from this country, heading to China. The Kenya-Tanzania border cuts across vast stretches of savanna, much of which has been set aside for wildlife conservation. It's yet another avenue for American influence. This team of private rangers was set up and trained by military intelligence veterans from the US. We're in Kitirwa Conservancy, which is one of the oldest nature conservancies in Kenya. We're following a group of anti-poaching rangers to the border. These guys do not work for the Kenyan state. Their money comes from a major international wildlife conservation nonprofit called the International Fund for Animal Welfare. In spite of that, they're the sort of de facto border authority for this region. Right here. Big bull. That thing is incredible. And they're taking us to a location where they recently found an elephant carcass. Oh, we actually just crossed the border, apparently. At least according to my map, which goes to show exactly how uh, unmarked and open it is. Here we are. Yeah. That smell. Yeah, it smells. When they were on patrol, they saw the vultures. So when they got close to, they realized that there was a cut on the face and the ivory was, ivory was missing. So what we had to do is conduct our colleagues in Tanzania, if they're aware that um, there was a dead elephant. They told me that, yes, they are aware, and uh, it was a natural death. And so they came here, they removed every. So this, this elephant itself was not poached? Yes, not poached. So it, basically, they removed the tusks in order to prevent people, yes. other people, from removing the tusks yes. And, yes. And, and selling them, yes. and yes. selling the yes. ivory. Yes. Wow. The Conservancy and its rangers use counterinsurgency techniques developed by the American military to go after cross-border trafficking networks. But when it comes to the border itself, the American vision of the world runs into the reality of the savannah, with no clear way to reconcile the two. The American government and sort of law enforcement establishment has a certain view of international borders, whereby they believe that those borders should be strictly controlled and policed do you think that that kind of vision of border security could work in a place like this? I don't think. I don't think. But one, one thing is, um, do we even have an idea of why this border was placed here? Nobody knows, because this was one community. 
but the work that you do is is you know you you do work on in some way controlling the flows across this border yes, right illegal business five days ago one of the guys was arrested with sacks of maize but putting pieces of ivory inside and they use as well uh small trucks to traffic um we call it bang did you call it marijuana yeah, yeah the, a lot of it goes through here really yeah from tanzania do you think it will ever be possible to get everyone who's moving goods from one side to another to go all the way to Namanga and, and cross on the, the, the official crossing? Or are you just going to constantly be fighting this? We control what we can. Uh, we will stop what we can. The land border is so vast that there's no way to really police it. In Kenya's major port city, there's a different set of obstacles. We are in Mombasa, which is a hub for the trafficking of various illicit substances and goods in lots of different directions. And we've been waiting all afternoon to meet up with some people who just brought in uh, a shipment of cocaine, which um, will then be redistributed from here to markets both domestic and uh, sort of further along on the chain. other places or does it mostly stay here in Mombasa? China. China? Yeah. Dubai. Dubai. So uh, like Arab countries and Asian countries? Mm -hmm. Do you know where this comes from? Sure. Where does it come from? Pakistan, Colombia. How much do you pay for this amount and how much do you make selling this amount? For a pocket, I think so, no? Yeah. It goes around uh, 10,000 dollars. And how much do you make from each one of these half kilos? So half kilo of this one, I make like around 15. I know that there's been a big effort by the Kenyan government with help from the US government and some other governments to sort of do everything possible to stop this exact kind of activity. Has that had any effect on your business? Those people who are in the government are the ones who also do this kind of job. So is that the relationship you have with the police here? Yeah, sure. You can't do this job if you don't have a relationship with police. Yeah. Because police and you, always. Mombasa has been a trading link between Africa and Asia for centuries. That has always involved a mix of legal trade and a fair bit of piracy and smuggling. Whether it's garlic and spices or narcotics and poached ivory, all manner of goods flow through here. Legal or not, they always have, and they probably always will. Over the centuries, that movement and exchange also shows up in the culture. For instance, in the music. These guys are called Seputuko Band. They're playing a genre of music called Tada, which is very unique to this strip of coastline. It's a type of music that really summarizes a sort of cultural hybrid that could only happen here. It could only happen in Mombasa and other cities along the Swahili coast. It's, it's extremely special, and we get to see it, which I'm excited about.
Can you tell me a little bit about the history of Tarab music? Tarab imetokea coastal region ambayo ni Unguja, Pemba, Zanzibar, Mombasa, Tanzania, Tanga. Tarab imekuwa kwa mababu zetu, nyanya zetu na sisi pia tumeikuta Tarab na bado ni inaendelea. The types of dancing that we saw tonight. Mm -hmm. That's not how people used to dance to tarab music. Exactly. Kwanza zamani uki dance kama vile, it was like niaibu, meone. Lakini sasa hivi, ah, watu wana diachia, watu wana dance. Kuna kama wana style yao moja, wana sema to chore. Sasa watu wana diachia, yani vile ambavu naeza. Sasa hiyo to chore, lazima uo umebariki wa kidogo. Yani ndo uonyeshe. Zile mugs vizuri. Chaza kituo. I think music and culture and, and Tadab as an example is something that sort of unites Kenya and Tanzania, even though they're different countries? Exactly. They are just one people. Yeah. <laughs>